Well, thank you all for joining us today. Really, really excited for this week's seminar talk. My name is Jenna Morris. I'm a graduate student working with Dr. Brian Harvey in SEFS, and we'll be helping to facilitate our conversation today. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations, whose ancestors resided here since time immemorial and who thrive in this place, alive and strong. I also have the honor today of introducing our speaker, Polly Olson. Polly is a member of the Yakima Nation and a UW alum whose service to UW spans almost 20 years. She received her degree in anthropology and has served across multiple departments as a director of the Native American Center for Excellence, director of community relations and development for the Indigenous Wellness Institute, and advisor to the Washabalt Intellectual House. Currently, Polly serves as the first ever, ever tribal liaison for the Burke Museum. At the Burke, Polly supports Indigenous resiliency by creating space for healing and joy and she works alongside tribal communities across the Northwest to ensure that exhibits better represent their stories and living spirit. As a testament to her outstanding contributions, Polly received the UW Distinguished Staff Award last year and is a past recipient of the UW Diversity Award for Community Building. We are so grateful to have you with us here today, Polly, and are super looking forward to what we're going to talk about today. Um, before I hand it over, um, everyone else who's attending, feel free to post your questions in the chat throughout. It sounds like we'll be able to have a pretty open and fluid conversation today. So anything that you want to ask, we'll try to get to. So yeah, all yours, Polly. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Jenna, for the lovely um, introduction. And, and I will go ahead and, and do my own. As Jenna said, I'm Polly Olson. I am the um, a member of Yakima Nation and the director of the tribal, the, what am I? I am all kinds of things today. Goodness, many hats. Uh, I'm the tribal liaison for the Burke Museum. Uh, today, it is an honor to speak with you. Um, I've, I've been reflecting um, actually the past few weeks on um, my role and, and the conversations that I've been having in the College of the Environment and Forestry and, and helping Tom Hinckley facilitate the Yakima Nation uh, field trip class that, that they've had and hosted for 19 years. Um, my two baby brothers, my two little brothers are the founders and um, organizers of that class. And, and as Tom is looking to retire, we're, we're trying to figure out how to keep this class up and running in that relationship um, alive and strong. Um, and so it feels like I'm, I'm leaning towards um, getting very involved in that, that aspect. My past history was, was really spent a lot of, was spent in health. And so working on a curriculum and health issues in Indian country through the Whammy region, which the University of Washington serves as well as workforce development for health career professionals. But my passion is really workforce and helping our young people from all the tribes, any native, indigenous, any, any student actually, who's interested in their career path and needs a mentor to think about um, creative opportunities and how to navigate the ecosystem, the academic ecosystem, um, being available to be an auntie to them as they come here um, at the university. when. When I was here in the 90s, um, I didn't have one, but I knew that we that was that was something that was always talked about in, in academic papers or in uh, the mission of colleges and departments. Um, but yet we really didn't implement any of that until we built the Longhouse, um, until we built Wasleib Alt, where we really now have a safe space uh, to bring our, our indigenous and uh, students of color in to have some really um, deeper conversations and and think about um, academia and the impact that we have on the world. Um, so today it's going to be a fluid conversation. I'd, I'd like Jenna to, to kind of help me stay in my lane in, in the topics we're going to talk about, but also um, help you with knowledge building in the area of understanding tribal sovereignty, um, understanding and, and thinking about how we conduct research. Uh, you're coming in through a Western lens. And so uh, thinking about how do we shift 
this Western lens to be more inclusive of um, what I call other ways of knowing or traditional ecological knowledges and, and actually building relationships so that um, we can all work to address the harm to planet, to climate, um, and do a better job working together. I feel like I'm speaking like Biden today, this uniting and, and we need to you know do the healing together, but that has been our practice. That is the practice of indigenous peoples um, from since time immemorial. So I will pause there, Jenna. That's awesome and so important. I was lucky enough to actually take Ernesto's fire ecology class and visit the Yakima Nation last year, which was such such an awesome experience and really grateful that that partnership has been built before I arrived. And yeah, looking forward to hopefully it continuing and building. And I guess to start us off, do you have a sense of like where we are in terms of um, breaking down barriers to increasing the prevalence of TEK in our school, our society? Basically, like where are we? Where do you see um, our paths forward? That's a very good and very big question. Um, <clears throat> I, th I think I think people I think um, the faculty and I think our our graduate students and and our learners that are coming up are starting to um, validate and starting to lean in to the 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 part of relationship relationship with people and the environment rather than the relationship with the book and the written word. And I think that um, I feel that the shift is going on and having these really deeper conversations and um, hearing good um, climate change practices, good conservation practices, and as well as reactionary practices, you know, from prescribed fire burns to uh, taking dams down so that we can uh, protect our fish and other other relatives that live in the waters, as well as um, taking care of the plants that are also on you know on the on the river riverbeds. I mean, there's just so many layers because we're all intertwined. So where are we today? We're still infants as far as where academia is to relationship to the old stories and the old practices. Um, to our creation stories that we live to sustain um, the, the environment as well as, as our culture and, and our, our relationship to land. Our relationship to land base is, um, uh, people romanticize it, but what they really, you know, if you move romanticism out of the way and actually look at the science, the relationship is about harmony. It is about um, respect. It is about understanding the, the ecosystem and the, and the biodiversity that, that is within the environment that we are and, and changing our, our attitude um, that we're the alpha protector. We're, we're actually the alpha predator, you know, if you kind of want to use that language. And I'm going to pause there and just say, this is my story. I just want to clarify, this is my story, my lived experience, my conversations with my family. I come from a family of foresters. I come from a family of, of cultural knowledge bearers. And um, those are both huge responsibilities and how do we do that together? So this is my lived experience that I am sharing with you today. We are so grateful for that. Um, I guess you spoke a little bit about it, but can you speak a little bit about some of the biggest challenges currently? And maybe our next step is to think about how we can facilitate um, approaching some of those challenges, either as individuals, within our context in CEPHs, within our broader context, within um, the Pacific Northwest. Any ideas about that? I think the first one, it's going to come back to relationship. And so as, uh, as you think about uh, your science projects or your research projects that you're doing, the first thing you need to do is if you create this question, you need to think who's at the table and who's always brought to the table first are the appointed faculty members. 
but you need to really step back and ask the question, who's not at the table? And whose land are you, um, are you researching or how, where are you gonna be doing your field work? Um, all of this land was indigenous land. Um, indigenous land is not only on reservations, you know, that's where we reside now and we were forced to be in those um, areas. But our, Seattle's my usual and accustomed land of the, of the Akma Nation. I'm also Cowlitz. Um, my grandmother was Cowlitz. So I come east side, west side. And so there's a broad breadth of knowledge and access to resources that my family you know, has as we move forward. So first one is who's not at the table? Whose land, where are you gonna be doing your field work? And, and who are the usual and accustomed stewards of that land? It, I'm thinking of private, I'm thinking of federal agencies, but I'm also thinking of tribal sovereign nations that are engaged in conversations. So what happens is as the project gets going and people start thinking about, then we get an aha moment either at the end or you know, midway through or after funding has been allocated. And then it's been, oh, we should have tribes a part of the conversation. And that's where the challenge is, is because, and that's where tribes are exhausted because you're approached after you've already gone in and done the work. We have a, we may be do, working on the same issue and we could have supported and strengthened your, your thesis, or your proposal or your NSF or whatever grants you're going for. We could have strengthened that ask had that conversation happened at the beginning and, and co-created the research project. Um, so for, for us as sovereign nations, it's exhausting to then be brought to the table too late in the process. And, and that's always been the, the react, we're reacting. So then we're upset and we'll say, no, you know, no, we're not gonna work with you because that respect hasn't been shown at the beginning of the project, right? Um, so then people struggle with, with then fear because you probably got a cultural spanky um, and, and then just trying to understand where the harm was, where did this process, where did it break down in the process? and not taking it personally, but looking at how to redevelop, how to re-engage in a new relationship. Um, if you start at the beginning, you've got them for life because you've built the respect, right? And you've built the trust and you're, you're, you're having the conversations with, with our tribal leaders or our professionals, our DNR professionals and, and others out there. Um, Another huge challenge in, in tribal politics and tribal government is we're always in litigation with the federal government around these issues. And so prioritizing then supporting a graduate student or an academic research project when we're having to get the lawyers up to, you know, capital to, to save our sovereignty, to save our land, to save the environment, um, to save the fish, to, you know, whatever the issues are. Is, I find, I hear we're in more litigation. It feels like, more and more litigation than we are actually working on prevention, which is, and that's how the federal government set our, our governing systems up. Again, my opinion, opinion. <laughs> so um, those are two big ones for me right now. That's really challenging. Um, <laughs> I can't even begin to imagine all the legal headaches. And yeah. Not great. Um, so I was curious what your advice is for researchers or students, if they are interested in working with tribal communities, we need to approach that at the beginning of our project to co-develop these things. Um, do you have any advice for beginning that and building trust and doing it in a way that acknowledges that that is not tribal communities jobs and it's an additional ask of them? Right. Anything you can speak to that? <clears throat> well, I think we're working on that process right now and that approach. Um, um, I think I think the work really has to come from the faculty members to go out and build the relationships because 
the students are writing on the coattails of the faculty's um, projects and relationships and building upon the, that, that academic um, platform that they're, they're working on. Um, so having these conversations is actually a really good start to understanding um, that we need, that, that faculty need to shift and, and engage in relationship outside of uh, their comfort zones um, and their own um, pedagogies and, and that. I think Asakusa is doing a good job with the Tribal Leadership Summit and bringing some of these conversations forward. Um, I, at the Burke Museum right now, have elevated, so as their first tribal liaison, I'm elevating our Oregon Advisory Board to create these policies and these practices. And one of the big questions is, is how do we create a research platform within the Burke Museum with our collections? And how do we, so, you know, I'm not only putting this on, on UADEB faculty or faculty members I talk to around the nation, I'm, I also realize that the tribes have to also figure out, um, are they interested in research? What are their research protocols, especially in um, environment, biology, climate change, um, uh, engineering, I mean, all of these other disciplines. Health is doing a better job than um, the other side because because health is, 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 is scary, human subjects. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we, we, we need to come together and figure out what kind of, what would research collaboration be with tribal communities in, in these fields? So as I said, we're in infancies and, and having these conversations and really thinking about it is, is a really good start and being open-minded um, and being able to listen. Absolutely. Um, drawing from your experience as a member of the Yakima Nation and the Cowlitz Nation, where do you see needs for research within the realm of CEPHs um, and potential key partnerships that we could be developing? Oh, there are so many. I mean, forest health, definitely. Um, um, forest health and then, you know, harvesting and, and the capitalism of our forest products, I think is a, is a very good one. Um, any any water issues water is our first medicine so any water issues and and how that ties together i'm oh there's just so many i you know there really is you know we have the nucleolum fish hatchery so i think there could be some really good work and they're building the new dam at the reservoir at cleolum and there could be a really great uh, study and resource on on how they're flowing and and, and that's in collaboration with the Corps of Engineers and Yakima Nation and, and other agencies that are that are building to restore these these salmon. I would say, what was it, 10 years ago, the first steelhead salmon returned up the Cleolum River. So there's some some work there. Um, another question, I guess. If you were given like an unlimited budget and the most optimistic, <laughs> um, nothing could stop you from achieving your goal. What would your vision be in terms of our path forward in academia or in developing these partnerships? Well, for this particular college, I think what would be really, um, really unique and really fascinating and, and <clears throat> really beneficial to, to all communities is to creating like, you know, an indigenous, like a native conserva environmental conservation program bigger than just the Yakima Nation field trip. And that we can involve other tribes to be involved. I think we have a framework with this class that we could tap into other communities and, 
you know, learn about fisheries, what, you know, Suquamish is doing with their fish fisheries, you know, what about what happened with the farm um, salmon up at Swinomish or Anacortes area, you know, how can, how can we tap into these conversations with tribes that can really bring and strengthen um, strengthen our teachings here at the University of Washington. So I think a native like certificate program or a minor would be a native focus, a sovereign nation's native focus would really benefit the students coming through. Because I know that when students go through these, this Yakima class and, and Ernesto's classes and a couple other um, faculty offer some good teachings that your mindset and your work shifts in how you're approaching the work that you're doing in the environment. And, and it's not just native. I mean, there's all of these other global indigenous peoples that are doing great things too. But, but we always go off to the bigger world and we don't just stay here and do our own work here at home. And I think that's a challenge too, is we think we need to go into third world countries or go across the waters. Well, we got enough, we got enough stuff here that we could really be working on in partnership with our, with our sovereign nation. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I guess in terms of talking about positive partnerships, can you speak a bit more to folks who maybe aren't as familiar with the Yakima Nation field trip, that class, um, just some kind of the framework of it, what are the positives, what are the challenges? Um, the yak, I can't remember the class, the course number four. I don't know what it is. You guys can find it. That's your, that's your hunting job. Um, what, what Tom does and, and Ernesto do is they bring together and we have um, some lecture series and we prepare you. We, we, we educate you on the treaty. We educate you on the history of the Yakima Nation and the colonial impact from Manifest Destiny to um, uh, some of the the cultural practices that that happen. And then we actually go out for a three, two day, two night trip out to the reservation. And there you meet with tribal leaders, tribal council leaders, and you have conversations with professionals that work in Department of Natural Resources and cultural resources. And we take you out into the closed area. And the closed area of the Yakima Nation is the forested area um, east side of Pato of Mount Adams down through, it's about, <clears throat> it's a huge landmass. And we take you through and we show you restoration projects. Uh, we show you our food gathering areas. We show you impact of wild horses that are running and the overburden of wild horses on our uh, food gathering areas. And they also show you some water, water systems, some spring systems that have been uh, reversed. They were harmed by the horses or cows harvesting or cows um, what do cows do when we, well, you know what I'm trying to say, I think. Um, and, and showing how the tribe is, has taken back and restored the lands back to its natural setting so that those, thank you. Thank you, Dan, for putting it in the chat. Um, just restoring the lands so that the water is clean and that the water is, is taken care of, taking care of log booms. So you go out and you have those conversations. They also, I believe, take you to the longhouse where we um, have uh, dinner with some elders and some conversations. If, if we're staying in the lowlands, sometimes you will also camp up at Camp Chaparral, which is where we have all our youth, veteran, elders, um, summer camps and activities up there. So to camp up there. And continue to just have conversations with all kinds of different community members, food gatherers, hunters, loggers, um, leadership, um, et cetera. It's really, really impactful from storytelling to policy updates to general practices uh, that we are working on um, within the tribe. Yeah, as I said earlier, I can definitely attest to how valuable and special that class and opportunity is. So grateful for you for <laughs> helping in that and opening your home to students from all over. This year we had COVID. And so what we ended up doing was having um, 
one and a half hour seminars and we would just zoom in all of these speakers and, and it actually it turned out okay over zoom we were able to bring more speakers in and have a deeper conversation with with our tribes one of the things that um, I worked on, a, I'm working on an NSF grant. It was submitted to, to work with Yakimas in their youth program. And what I found out was, what I learned is that 60% of our enrolled tribal members that live on the reservation work for the Department of Natural Resources, 60%. And so when I think about workforce development, we're thinking about our, our future generations and our youth coming through and we're, we're, and when I hear the college say, well, there's no natives out there, right? You know, they're not applying or this, that. well, we're not doing our outreach appropriately. If 60% of our people are working for Department of Natural Resources then we're doing something wrong. It's not the tribes or the youth doing something wrong. So um, yeah, we're gonna figure out and, and think about what is our outreach and how do we think about um, getting our young people in and how do we help them understand the science and, and also validate their lived experience um, as well. So that was a really phenomenal number for me. Um, and we need, we need to be more present to that. And I believe, I imagine that's the same for Colvilles or Quileutes or Quinault you know, that are all surrounded by the forest, but I think everybody has a huge, the priority is, is Department of Natural Resources. So, you know, our natural resources are our, our life ways, so we need to take care of them. Totally, that's really interesting. And going off along those lines, you mentioned that when you started out, you didn't really have any mentors who shared similar experiences to you and how we really need to rethink outreach in a thoughtful and more concerted way to incorporate um, Indigenous students into our school and their ways of knowing as well, diversify that. Do you have any thoughts on uh, barriers that currently exist to those efforts? And it's not, you already mentioned that this is a work in progress, but do you have any insights on some ways to break down those barriers? Um, step outside of the box of thinking that grades are the the only identifiers of a good student. I, you know, I think I think that there's other ways that we could look at the admissions process and find um, other um, identifiers or an other rating system or, or whatever for our students to um, be successful at the University of Washington. I think the standardized tests and this numbers game that we use, uh, Rubik's designs that we use for admissions is really harmful. Um, and, then, and then being able to, to plug our young people in with the native staff and faculty that are here at the University of Washington. One, to be able to have the conversation and to change the climate that, that, that we help, we're committed, we're there. If we hear about our, our young people being here, we're there, we're all in um, to help them be successful. And, um, and, if, and, and hang on to them. I, what, I've, what I find is if a student really dreams to become an engineer or physician, or uh, get their BS degree. If they start to fall behind, they, you know, the schools immediately release them and then and then tell them to go into AIS, American Indian Studies, and that's not cool. That's a that's bias, and that's not doing our work for, on retention. I've seen that way too often. Way too often. So. Yeah, I was really encouraged to hear that CEFS has recently dropped the GRE requirement for grad students. <laughs> so some positive development there in terms of um, how we admit students. Diving into a slightly different topic. So we obviously have um, this developed partnership that we're hopefully going to sustain appropriately with the Yakima Nation. Do you have any other examples, either with your work as a tribal liaison, of other like 
exciting collaborations between UW and tribal communities? Um, just any other success stories or opportunities? Yeah, one that I also, there's several that I work with on campus, but there's the um, Alternative Spring Break program and they have an arm that's called the Pipelines. No, now they're called the Riverways. We changed their name. They're the Riverways program and they work with Yakima and uh, Macab, but they go out during spring break and work with fourth and fifth graders um, out in these tribal communities, both Colville, I mean, all kinds of rural communities. And so we're always looking for student ambassadors and mentors. It is an undergraduate. I don't know if, if there's graduate opportunities, but when they come to campus, you know, if we built a relationship and when these kids come to campus, we show up and we greet them and we, we help them feel safe and welcome. Um, we're making a shift in their, their um, trajectory to higher education because um, they'll see themselves as one. Creating a safe space at the University of Washington is really, really important. Um, and so the more we can bring young, young kids from rural communities, not just tribes, but rural communities to the city that, that they can feel safe and that they can navigate the, the campus, um, they'll consider us. I have heard tribes say, they'll, they'll say, they'll tell me that I didn't hear correctly, but I do hear tribes say, and I hear Yakima say that um, we, we push for education and the University of Washington is a cultural arm to our lived practices. Um, I think Asakwa Cha shared a few years ago that 500 University of Washington degrees were awarded to Yakima tribal members at different levels. So again, we have these successes, but we're not showcasing these successes. And, and the College of Forestry probably has some of the highest graduate rates, especially out of Yakima Nation, if not other tribes as well. Um, so, we should highlight those. Most of my family are all U of graduates and from the College of Forestry. Yeah. That's awesome. And definitely strengthens our convictions that we have a huge role to help play in all of this. I'm curious, so you're the first tribal liaison for the Burke Museum. Um, I know that the new Burke just opened not too long ago. Um, I'm curious if you could just speak to your experience, like how much um, liberty were you given in like crafting it in your own vision, as well as um, with uh, input from other tribal communities so that it could be a better representation and just a better Burke. Now you're getting into my jam, my hard work. Um, most of the designs in the building was, was set in stone and it was moving, it moved along. They hired me in uh, two, what are we? Two, they brought me in 2017. And so all of it was up, it was pretty much up. And we had the Native American Advisory Board that really hadn't been fully functioning, but it, it was for, for certain museum practices, but not for the overall. So I started, I pulled them all together. We have 15 um, members from around the state of Washington, pulled them together, started engaging a new conversation. Um, and, and I rebuilt trust with, with our members. And with that, as we move forward, we started talking about um, what kind of cultural practices can we bring into the museum? What kind of cultural work can we do to, to protect the, I call all of the artifacts ancestors, not everybody likes that, but they're a living being of somebody at some point. They were a living being, meaning the fish or the mammals or the dinosaurs, they all were living at one time. So they, um, what can we do to protect them? They have not seen the light in 75 years and they're moving to a new building. And so how do we take care of um, this resource in a good way? And so, and I also recognized in introducing myself around the museum that there was a lot of fear about this move, a lot of fear of, of harm happening to very fragile items. And so I, I talked to our elders, our, our advisory board and said, what can we do to take care of the staff? 
they're scared, they haven't, no, you know, we haven't said thank you, we always react, right? No, you're not doing this right, you know, the cultural spankies. Um, but what can we do to start healing and, and to, to help them know that we love and appreciate them for the work that they're doing? So we agreed to conduct a ceremony that is specifically for the Burke, and it was called the Blessing of the Hand Ceremony. And it was a cedar spring water brushing but it's specific to the Burke Museum staff and volunteers. We included the construction workers. We included everybody that, that was around and could join us that were involved in all aspects of building to de demolishing, to moving, to volunteering. And so we came together and we've had that ceremony. Um, we've officiated that ceremony four times um, in that time. So in the old building, to get them ready. Um, we did it again as we went into the new building to welcome and bring the breath into the new building and to what we also feel was wake up the ancestors so that they were prepared and knew what we were doing. And this sounds like wonky talk, but this is actually really important work. Um, this is really important intentional work. It's very similar to how the research should be conducted. It's intentional. Um, and so we moved them and then we also had a, another gathering of songs um, and words to the old building to say thank you and that you are going to be some, come something different. And as we moved in. So what we did, and that was building trust because I was bringing in multiple spiritual leaders from around the state that represent different religious practices. And we we did this work in a really good way. Not one was better than the other. Um, we had an order that we agreed upon, but everybody was willing to participate and everybody supported that. So we've, we've, we've gone through that and we've built that into the museum. Uh, during the grand opening, we had live, uh, live uh, performances from artists from around the world um, and youth groups and I, I oversaw that, I did not create that, but helped um, find groups from our areas. Um, we had, we had um, some of our curators brought in artists and people that they've worked with and studied with, and, and they brought in and, and did uh, workshops, carving workshops or, you know, weaving workshops or other things. So that was really lovely. And, and so now we're just, we're, we're continuing that work, but in time of COVID, it's a little bit different. So bringing living practices. And now that they feel that they are a part of the home, now we can do the hard work of creating research policies, creating um, uh, narrative changes or whatever we're, we're, we're talking about. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's awesome. I did not join UW until after the new book was around. So I wasn't able to see the old one, but it is so awesome and it's so awesome to hear that it's being built as a place of celebration and not of just taking and displaying incorrectly and actually honoring the legacies and the histories that are still here, the living histories. So that's really but we, cool. But we do have to have that real conversation about colonial trauma you know, about the stealing and about, you know, and, and not sit in it, but we have to be able to acknowledge it in order to move through it. And, and, and that's something that, that a lot of academic um, spaces don't invite into, into the, the conversation. Absolutely. Um, can you speak a little bit to how that process went or how it felt? Being more um, honest and yeah. I, yeah, I will start on, on the tribal side. So when I would go out and visit, we worked on our land acknowledgement and it looks like it's a standard land acknowledgement. But when I went out for six to nine months and did tribal consultation, as well as consultation with our NAB. And so when I would go out into tribal, into Indian country and get in front of their tribal councils, leaders and stuff, um, it was brutal. It, it was brutal because they could speak openly to me. They could um, let me have it. I have to have a thick skin to take on 
where, where they can safely say that, you know, the harm that the collectors or the harm that that happened through the, I mean, all of it, boarding schools, genocide, um, uh, economic development and, and having to sell our, our, our wares, you know, to survive and, and just, just the harm. So they let me have it, right? And then I have to bring that back and educate the non-native staff and leadership at the Berg. And then, so I'm, I'm in this middle, I'm in this, I, I walk at the two worlds, right? Um, and so then on the, on the flip side in academia, I get challenged with uh, the colonial Western science approaches. I get challenged that, you know, our ways aren't valid and, and everything defaults to culture. So trying to, trying to, to tilt, to listen, but to push back as well. And, and I'm not locked into this word, but I'm gonna use it that, no, I'm not gonna use it. So defensiveness that comes from pushback to um, academia, um, it, 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 it gets hard because, you know, when I'm having these conversations, I'm not blaming you. I'm not, I'm not trying to create white guilt. I'm just trying to have an authentic conversation about the history and it needs to be spoken, but you don't need to take on that burden to feel defensive. So we're all on our own personal journey, I as well. And so being able to just sit and hold that space and acknowledge it because the history you've been taught is not accurate. Right, right, Jenna, you with me? Absolutely, yeah, thank you for being candid about that and sharing that. But like you said, yeah. we're all on our own journeys, but it's important to hear a more authentic history. Yeah. So um, apparently I'm the vessel to help you have those conversations. <laughs> I really yeah. appreciate that. Um, before I open it up to any questions folks have, I want to make sure that if there's anything that we didn't touch on, we get a chance to talk about that. So, you know, Indian Ed 101, one hour does not cover it. So let's just, I'm meeting you where you're at. And um, if we want to have future conversations, we can do that. So let's let's open it up. Yeah, if folks have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we can read them. Or if you uh, would like to ask your own question, we can unmute you, I believe. Was coming in yet, but in the meantime, what has the day to day at the Burke been during COVID so far? I that's so funny because I thought my job was going to be kind of you know, I'd just be calling tribal leaders and talking to them, but Indian country got hit pretty hard, and um, I've been so much more busy administratively like getting my bylaws in order and trying to think about the restructure of the NAB and, and thinking about what are our, what's our strategic plan for the next three years. I am working on a, um, a stretch project right now, a stretch assignment, which we are going to hire a consultant to help us with, to do an assessment and alignment around diversity, equity, inclusion, access and inclusion, DEAI and decolonization. So a big part of my work has been having conversations. We're using decolonization right now as our word, but we think something is gonna come out that's different to what we're really doing. It's about relationship, it's about respect. And so I've been really busy trying to figure out how to, what do we need to do to, to decolonize, right? To shift science and to shift um, the messages that we're putting out to the public. And so working with our advisory board as well as our staff on, on how to move that forward. So we're gonna hire a consultant and that's gonna be a 10 month project, intense, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That's super exciting. Looks like we have a question. Um, Mark says, thanks so much, Polly. Really appreciate hearing about the work you do. It could be described as work to help translate ideas between important boundaries that exist around institutions. It seems like there's a need for more support and people doing the kind of work you do. Do you agree? 
Absolutely. Thank you. You summarized that very well, Mark. <laughs> yes. I don't know how to expand on that. It's just a yay. <laughs> I guess it's putting people in these positions that you're hiring for the 10 months. Too. Uh, I think that's, that's very true. I think the Burke is actually really acknowledging and seeing that shift, the shift in conversations, the shift in work, the shift in relationship because they've hired me. Uh, just today, uh, Dr. Julie Stein, we were talking and, and she said, I really am fascinated when I sit in the room with you and you're with, with our NAB or, or tribal community and you're having this conversation and you guys are talking about this stuff and I'm hearing one thing and you are getting all of this other knowledge and you're getting, you're getting, um, you're getting approvals for the work that we wanna do, but I didn't hear you ask them if we could do this work. And so she said, we've never been able to do that since you came on board. And, and started facilitating it, um, uh, you know, facilitating the conversations. So she's, she's learning, we have to retune, you have to always retune when retune your hearing, your hearing lens and in, in how we interpret. So interpretation is critical. That's been fun to, to watch them shift. Um, looks like Miss Van has a question. What are you most hopeful about in your work with bridging academia and tribal nations? Are you seeing a shift with how indigenous perspectives are perceived? Um, what am I most hopeful about in my work? I'm hopeful that somebody will replace me sometime and that I have somebody that has the same um, passion that I do. Um, I am seeing a shift in um, indigenous perspectives. I am seeing a shift in the conversations. We, we do need to um, create more safe spaces and more opportunities for other voices to come to the table. So I think that that is gonna be really great when we can bring in Tyson Johnson from Quinault, who's an alumni, he's councilman out there and have him share his stories or, um, you know, um, Don Matomic from the executive director for Intertribal uh, Timber Council to share stories with you and, and others. So yeah, just expanding the table. Thank you, Lisanne. Um, Dan says, thank you, and asks, are there good examples of projects, courses, or new knowledge generated through deep combination of TEK and Western science? Say that again. Yes. Are there good examples of projects, courses, or new knowledge generated through deep combination of TEK and Western science? Yeah, one of our um, alum, one of our faculty members who left is um, Dr. Megan Bang. She was in the College of the Environment. And she she is just the queen of this work. So Megan Bang, she went home to um, Northwestern in Chicago, um, but she still has strong ties here. I would say, a, you know, a strong contemporary. Um, present academic that is doing this work right now is, is Megan. Um, and, and she's really writing some really amazing publications. And she ran a youth program out of our College of Education here called STEAM. It's called something else, but it was around STEAM. Um, I think the co our College of Education has some great scholars in, in, their, in, their, in their departments or in their staff. Um, Dang, I think I'm isolated to just you, Dub. I think I better get outside my box. <laughs> um, uh, why don't Why don't I think about that, Jenna? And if I come up with other resources, I'll get that to you. You can share it out. If you have maybe something that you can post it on your website or on your seminar blog or something. Yeah, I'd be absolutely happy to do that. That would be excellent. Um, looks like Twi asks, is a, or they say, hi, Polly. I was in your yeah. academy class last quarter. 
It's lovely to hear from you again. Thank you for spending time with us today. Um, Twi asks, what are your visions for this upcoming year in regards to the Berg? Reopening. Uh, also an outpouring of support from everyone from Bernie Sanders to the... The inauguration, yeah. <laughs> the politics are coming into our seminar. Um, I think I think our vision is to open the Burke and keep it open and keep it a safe place for people to come and visit and get out into the world and start to to get out and move out of our own apartments and um, um, our, our our homes and our spaces. I think a vision of me again is this assessment and alignment project to really find out where we are in decolonization when where we have blind spots and and looking at creating what we're looking at as a healing plan um, but it's more of how to have those real conversations and align um, align ourselves to be a better natural history museum to break down one of the big questions that fascinates me is why are indians why is native culture side by side with dinosaurs right why why is our culture and stuff always in a natural history museum and so I think that's kind of the bigger tickler in, in the back of my head. But now, I mean, we've been here for 136 years, you know, side by side at the Burke Museum. So why can't we do work together and talk about, um, you know, what was, what were those interactions like? How, how do we read the grasses when climate change happens and it moves up the river? And what can the tribes tell you? When, when those climate change were happening from our old stories and stuff. Anyway, so it's it's this reciprocity that I'm really looking forward to seeing and getting the scientists involved in. Changing the paleontologists' attitudes that they don't have to ask for permission to go into the field and collect dinosaurs. That's not true. Totally. Yeah. Stacy asks, there's a big push for racial equity and improving cultural competency in 2020, particularly in the light of protests against police brutality, against black and brown bodies. Do you feel like the UW community and beyond has kept this momentum and energy? And how can we make sure to keep this momentum and make real progress in our organizations? Um, I'll be honest, I struggle with this one. I, 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 I'm behind the social justice movements I'm behind it but I also I also I also mourn I also feel sad because because we'll all stand I love my African-American I love my black friends I love my Latinx friends but we're the original peoples of this land we should have been priority in these social justice movements because you're on my <laughs> land and to always push us to the side and erase us and think that we're isolated. So it's really, I'm just sad. And so has enough been done? No. Can we be more inclusive? Back to my first statement in the beginning, who's not at the table? Especially in this, um, these social justice conversations, who's not at the table? This isn't just a black and white thing. So I think I'm shifting from, from kind of I'm not shifting, I'm not going to erase it, but it, but diversity is important, but it's a box checking mechanism. And so I think we need to work on, on and it's an and do better at inclusion. And the inclusion allows space for everyone to be at the table rather than excluding. But I'm I'm still working on how to do that. Absolutely. Same in our own spaces. The I and DEI is so incredibly important. Yeah, it should be <laughs> big. Absolutely. Yeah. That's my opinion though, folks. That's not, I'm just, I'm owning it. That's what I live. Yeah. Looks like there aren't any new questions coming up just yet, but I also want to say, I believe it still will be, but visiting the Burke is free for students. Yes. Is that right? It is free for staff, students, and faculty. 
Yeah. So, so just folks, go ahead. Um, bring your ID card, but actually we're doing online reservations. So get online and make your reservation. I'm sure there's a place to identify that you're a student or staff or faculty. So we'll be doing time, time commitments, time ticketing um, until COVID is not going to harm us. And I hope you all um, get your vaccinations. Yeah, hopefully soon. Who knows yeah. when that'll happen. But yeah, I would encourage folks and myself to go visit the Berg if they haven't already because it's so cool. And it's here. Yeah, we're we're looking at maybe next Tuesday. Oh my gosh. If if uh, King County moves into phase two, we're immediately we're we're getting open as soon as we can. That's super exciting. I guess before we leave, um, do you have any other final thoughts or anything that you would like to leave us with? Well, thank you for showing up today. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I hope that you are able to tune in and think about how you're engaging in your, your academics and what's missing in your academics and how you can find uh, those resources to be successful and to expand your knowledge base um, even deeper than what you're what you're receiving here. And I hope that you are become awesome, amazing citizens and professionals um, once you leave this institution. Or maybe you'll stay with us like I did. Who knows? Go dogs. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Polly. We really, really, really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and share your lived experiences and advice with our departments really special. Um, so yeah, on behalf of Seth's, on behalf of myself and other grad students, super, super grateful to have you here. And yeah, thanks uh, to Dan to allowing us to facilitate this conversation today and give some input on who the awesome speakers we want to see present at our school are. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the graduate students who put me on your list. I'm really honored. So look forward to seeing you someday in person. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Looking forward to meeting you, maybe at the Burke sometime in person. There we go. Cool.